The T-shirt read, it's hard to be humble when you know you are the greatest. It was bought from Carnaby Street in the late 70s when it was a fashion to wear a white T-shirt with blue letters that had been ironed on. With that many letters, it must have cost my sister a lot of money. It's hard to be humble when you know you are the greatest. And those words could have been spoken, couldn't they, by three-time heavy boxing champ, heavyweight boxing champion of the world, Muhammad Ali, who's famous, isn't he, for declaring, I am the greatest. And in fact, he went on to say, I said that even before I knew that I was. <laughs> they brought out a film of his life in 1977 called The Greatest. It was based on a book entitled The Greatest, My Own Story, authored by Muhammad Ali. The film starred Muhammad Ali as himself. You get the picture. He thought he was the greatest. Many people have a yearning to be great, to be recognised, respected, perhaps even adored. Many would like to be great, perhaps in at least one thing. And I guess that to be great today, you need a fantastic physical body, to be a fantastic physical specimen. I guess that you need to be popular, a celebrity or having a vast social media following, because that's where much of the power lies today. I guess you need to be wealthy, to be great today, a combination of beauty and popularity and power and wealth, between them they combined for greatness. But what if there really was such a thing as real greatness? What if there was such a thing as real greatness in the eyes of God as defined by God? What would that greatness look like? And surely not the pictures that have been conjured up in our minds so far this evening. But if there was such a thing as real greatness, would you be interested in being great as God defines it and as God sees it? I mean, as disciples, surely we don't want to serve him in a way which is less than great, do we? if we know there is a greatness. Well, we start there this evening because the disciples here in Mark chapter 9 are clearly interested in being great. We see that in verse 34. Jesus has asked them what it was that they were disputing amongst themselves on the road. And in verse 34 we read, they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. It's not the only time in Scripture, is it, that we read of that concern. But both their motive for being great and their understanding of real greatness are clearly wrong. We learn that by, I think, two things. One is when asked what they were disputing about, they fall silent. So I'm guessing that they're ashamed. And secondly, I think we know that they were wrong in their assumptions and in their motives because of what Jesus says next, which surely is not merely teaching them, but also rebuking their hearts. You can imagine them, can't you? They're on, on the road, disputing who's the greatest. And you might say, well, that's a little ironic, isn't it? I mean, first of all, true greatness has just been revealed on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they're not going to compare with that, are they? It's a little ironic, secondly, because their failures and faithfulness abound. They've just been unable to drive out a demon. And they want to know who's the greatest. And thirdly, is it not a little or a lot ironic, because Jesus has just repeated something which is going to become a refrain, a chorus here in Mark's Gospel, revealing the nature of his own messiahship, his own greatness, which is going to lead to death and resurrection. And, of course, he's been teaching them that their discipleship needs to follow his messiahship. 
It's an ironic concern, isn't it? But Jesus teaches them here that there is a real greatness, but it isn't what they mistakenly thought. And so tonight we can learn from their mistake and what Jesus teaches. There is a true greatness. And if we're serious about being disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should aspire to that greatness for his sake. He gives, I believe, a threefold lesson here on true greatness. I don't know what you thought of the reading. When I first came across it, I thought, well, this is just a patchwork of disconnected thoughts. Well, of course, it's nothing of the sort. Let's look at these verses together this evening with a question. Do you want to be truly great? In the eyes of God, as God defines it, it is possible. Firstly tonight, verses 33 to 37, true greatness is found in lowly service. Lowly service. Let's be keen on lowly service. Let's reiterate that greatness is not found in beauty and popularity or power or wealth. But, you know, as we see true greatness this evening, it does have a beauty of its own. It does have a strength of its own. It has a richness of its own, as we will see. Let's look at the fact that true greatness is seen in lowly service. They've been disputing amongst themselves, verse 34. Matthew says they're disputing who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're going to look at. It's clear what it means. We can explain it, can't we? What are they arguing about? What are they disputing about there on the road? They're arguing about who is top dog. Who is number one amongst them? Who's going to be recognised as head and shoulders just better than all the others? Who's the greatest? It's an issue of status and self-promotion. Because none would have thought it going to be somebody else. Nobody would ask the question so they could say, well, yeah, it's going to be Thomas, isn't it? Thomas is the greatest. Oh, no, no, I, I, think, I think Simon Peter. I think it's, I, no, 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 none of them were thinking like that. They hadn't asked the question to give credit to others, had they? Behind the question is the thought, might it just be me? I mean, it ought to be me, hadn't it? I mean, I don't want to boast about it, but when you see all the, the mistakes of all the others, and then I'm not perfect, but... <laughs> It could be me, couldn't it? It just could be me. In a display of naked, self-seeking ambition and rivalry. Pride doesn't merely lurk here. It reigns. It's full frontal. There's a later question, isn't there, from the disciples. Who on merit deserves to sit at the right hand in the kingdom receiving the accolades? And who do you think they all thought was the right answer to that question? Oh, of course, they would sit there, had they been given that position, and they would speak about how humble they were to sit there. But underneath, they'd be quite smug, wouldn't they? I'm so grateful that they've recognised it. I'm so grateful that uh, I've been given the place that I deserve. We don't need to dwell on this too much, do we, by way of illustration or application. We all recognise what's going on here. In John's third letter in verse 9, he speaks of Diotrephes. And Diotrephes loved to have the preeminence among them. And that's something of our sinful hearts, isn't it? We, in our sophisticated and subtle way, love to have the preeminence amongst others. And that's true, isn't it? Because how put out we feel if we don't receive the recognition that we think we deserve. We don't make a big thing about it, but we fume within our hearts. And how jealous we can feel if somebody else receives recognition that we think should have come our way. Oh no, this naked, self-promoting ambition is very much alive. It's a great threat to church unity. Disputes because of pride. 
And Jesus, notice in verse 35, takes it very seriously indeed. He sits down. That's very key. He sits down to teach authoritatively. He calls the twelve and he says to them, oh, notice in a private setting, he's so kind to them. But in that private setting, very solemnly, he says, look, true greatness, and it's right to desire true greatness, involves you being the least of all and the servant of all. That's what true greatness is, boys. Because we heard this morning, Jesus is always turning the world's values on their head. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. You want to be great? Fine. Good thing to want to be, providing you know what true greatness is, which is being least of all and the servant of all. Well, who's going to volunteer for that? Who wants to be last in the race? Who wants to be last in the poll? Who wants to be last to be picked at school when they're picking the sports team? No one. Who wants to wait on tables? Who wants to be personally devoted to the most demeaning and undignified of tasks and roles? Who wants to be deacon for toilet cleaning? You'd have to be absolutely desperate, wouldn't you, to apply for a job where you're least of all and servant of all. And so to illustrate it further, Jesus takes a little child, small enough for him to hold in his hands, a child who in the Greek-Roman world was the bottom of the rung. Bottom of the rung in terms of entitlement and regard and treatment, the lowly and the most insignificant individual, and Jesus says, true greatness will receive, by implication, welcome, this one. True greatness will stoop below the lowest of the low to receive them and to welcome them. That's interesting, isn't it? We show our true receiving and welcoming of the Son and the Father, not with great claims, but in this way. Lowly, loving service, because that's greatness. Now, the illustration doesn't really work today because children, in many ways, are not the bottom of the rung. So here's another illustration for you. A wheelchair-bound, incontinent, noisy, somewhat unkempt with several unpleasant personal habits, elderly person enters the building on a Sunday night at five to six. Well, we can either pretend we haven't seen them and rush to our seat. Or we can leave them for somebody else to deal with. Or we can ensure that we're going to sit well apart from where they sit. Or we can rush to serve them. And sit with them. And toilet them, if necessary. And comfort them. And even in love, perhaps find somebody else to help us to do that if we think somebody else is capable. You want to be great? True greatness is seen in lowly service. Let's be keen for lowly service. Secondly, verses 38 to 41. True greatness is seen in prizing grace in others. First of all, true greatness is seen in lowly service. Secondly, it's seen in prizing grace in others. You see, these verses are connected. They follow on. Verse 38, now John answered him. It's a continuation. John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who doesn't follow us casting out demons in your name. We forbade him because he doesn't follow us. I wonder whether John isn't bragging there. I wonder if he isn't saying, well, Lord, we might not have welcomed the lowest of the low, but we have been unwelcome to a rumum, a badden. Pat me on the back, Lord, please. I think he's saying something here which he thinks is worthy of reward. He's awaiting applause. Well, what have they done? Well, they have seen someone who doesn't follow us. Not Jesus, 
us together. And the word us appears twice. That statement is made twice in verse 38. And this other fellow was casting out demons in the name of Jesus. So this fellow is coming across people that we've just met like the sun, demon-possessed, foaming at the mouth, and he's cast out a demon in the name of Jesus. And to John and the Twelve, well, this guy is a bit of a rogue, independent exorcist. Because he's not following us. And so, because they weren't prizing the grace in him, we forbade him. We commanded him with authority. We put a stop to him, boss. It seems to me that the John and the Twelve are rather dismissive of those who aren't in their camp of twelve. Rather dismissive of those not in their restricted group because they're not in the group following us. Perhaps it was well-meaning jealousy for Jesus and the Twelve. Perhaps it was just downright jealousy because they'd been able to exercise a demon and the others just hadn't. But Jesus does not commend their jealousy. Far from it. He simply turns to John and says, don't do what you've just done. It's bang out of order. It's wrong. And I'm going to give you three reasons, John, why you should not have done what you have just done. Number one, for, we get three fours here, for, to work a miracle in the name of Jesus, claiming his power and giving him the glory is not the behaviour of someone who soon afterwards will speak evil of me, Jesus says. Frankly, John, you've misjudged this one badly, ungraciously. Think, be wise. Of course there's a place for wisdom, but don't be over-suspicious of everybody not quite in your constituency, in the Twelve. It was wrong, John. Second reason it was wrong, John, for he who is not against us is on our side. John, the camp is bigger than you think. Our side, John... <laughs> He's bigger than you. I know that might hurt you. I know you're thinking about who's going to be the greatest. But John, the camp is far bigger than you. He who is not against us is on our side. Now, I know elsewhere, Jesus' emphasis is different. He who is not with me, notice singular, me, not us. He who is not with me is against me. But one, it's singular, and two, it's an entirely different context where Jesus is being accused of driving out demons by the power of Satan. Of course, the matter needs wisdom. Jesus is not advocating tolerance where there's no truth. But, you know, caution can be both overdone and underdone. Some of us are harshly narrow, some of us are stupidly gullible, and we need to learn the lessons. He who is not against us, John, is on our side. The one you've forbidden, John, is on our side. Third reason, a third four, don't dismiss what other dis disciples do, because even the lowliest service, John, will be rewarded. Jesus speaks here about whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ. Assuredly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. You might not prize the grace in others, John, but I can tell you that I do. Even in the least thing that they do for me and for my people. And there's lots of examples in Mark's Gospel of little things that people do, like cooking a meal, Peter's mother-in-law, or Levi welcoming people into his house. Things that many of us can do. Jesus says, you know, the, the least thing, a cup of water in my name, because you belong to Christ, will be rewarded. We can, in error, dismiss other believers. Thinking too highly of ourselves and what we do, and too lowly of them and what they do, out of pride, and I would suggest very often an insecurity and prejudice. 
Beware your nature and the prejudices of your pride. Illustration, Old Testament. Exodus, Numbers, sorry, Numbers, Eldad and Medad. Remember them? They are two Israelite elders. And Moses has been instructed to appoint 70 elders to help him bear leadership responsibility. And all of them are instructed to come to the tabernacle to receive God's power. And Eldad and Medad, for some reason we don't know why, they didn't come to the tabernacle, they stayed in the camp. But in the camp, they received power from the Spirit of God when the others did, and they started to prophesy in the camp. And dear Joshua, out of jealousy, I think, for Moses, hears this and says, Moses, go and forbid them. They shouldn't be doing that. They didn't come to the right place. They didn't disobey you. We all came to the right place. They didn't. Stop them. And Moses says, are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Joshua, it's bigger than the 68. It's bigger than you. This is kingdom of God stuff, Joshua. It's about more than you. And I believe that Moses' desire and prayer there, oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them was answered at Pentecost where your young men, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. You want to be great? Well, we all need to beware misplaced, sinful jealousy and zeal for our camp. Because that might be a sign of our insecurity and our prejudices. What we learn here is there's a place of generosity towards others and their ministries. If only John had said, oh, that there were more like him. If only there were more like him. Lord, wouldn't that be glorious? But he didn't say that. He said, we forbade him, because he doesn't follow us. The Apostle Paul rejoiced that Christ was preached, even out of selfish ambition, out of wrong motives. And in the same letter where we read that, he says in chapter 2, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Say that again. Let nothing, nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. You know, I'm tempted to say here that of all the sermons I've ever preached, this is the one I felt that the preacher most needs to listen to and hear. But in saying that, I'm in danger of drawing attention to myself. And of you thinking, well, isn't it good that he thought that? That's the way it is, isn't it? Do we want to be great? Do we want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in a way which is less than great? True greatness is seen in, firstly, lowly service. Secondly, in prizing grace in others. So let's be keen to do those two things. And then thirdly, and finally, true greatness is seen in dealing ruthlessly with our own sin. Really? Yes. Hmm. Dealing ruthlessly with our own sin. What? Not being a genius at pointing out other people's? I've got a gift for pointing out other people's sin. I can spot them a mile off. No, no, no. True greatness is seen in dealing ruthlessly with our own sin. There's another connection. Verse 42 says, But, but, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Do you want to be great? Well, beware your own capacity to cause others to stumble. Because that's not greatness. 
And here Jesus says, causing these little ones who believe in me to stumble. And our mind, first of all, goes to the child, of course. But I do wonder in context whether he's not speaking more generally of young and immature believers, those who believe in me. And in the context, don't you think he's probably speaking about the independent exorcist? Who John and the others have caused to stumble because they've forbidden him and discouraged him in his ministry. I think it's quite possibly that they're referring, Jesus is referring to him. Because he'd have felt the rejection, wouldn't he, and the disapproval of the twelve. And wouldn't that have caused him to stumble? Can I ask you to beware as much as we can of the negative impact we can have on other believers? especially those we proudly regard as more insignificant ones. There's so much damage done by not prizing one another and the grace that is at work in one another. Great damage is done sometimes by the simple absence of affirmation and encouragement. No, we don't encourage somebody if they've done something, well, we don't encourage them to have done something badly and wrong. We might have to admonish them in Colossians 3 terms. But we're still to encourage them as much as we can. So much damage is done in the church, not always by words. It can be done by looks or inaction or an absence of words. They can demonstrate our sinful disapproval of others. Seems to me it's very easy to lack a self-awareness of the damage which we cause, perhaps sometimes maliciously, but surely more often than not unwittingly to other believers. And we're so wrapped up in ourselves that we're not aware of it. And some people are so wrapped up in themselves and they don't seem to care. But it seems to me that this forbidding in verse 38 is regarded by Jesus as sin with serious consequences, causing somebody to stumble. And the seriousness of causing others to stumble is seen in that he speaks of what would then be regarded as a better experience which is having a millstone, a huge millstone from the mill tied around your neck and thrown into the sea, where even Peter Folding and Specialist Group International won't be able to find you with their sonar equipment. It would be better for you and I to be at the bottom of the sea with a millstone around us than for us to cause our brothers and sisters to stumble which I take here in context to be by not recognising and affirming the grace of God that's at work in them. Beware. Jesus goes on to say that all sin is serious. He talks here, of course, in picture language. He's not actually recommending that we get out a hacksaw to our wrists and our feet and our eyes, though perhaps you, like me, have known people who've tragically done that. He's talking here in figurative language. And he's saying, look, sin is so serious that whether it's your hand that causes you to sin or, or your foot or your eye, and historically the hand and the eye have often been interpreted in relation to sexual sin. If your hand or your eye causes you to sin, I don't think we should limit it to that. We don't appear to be too bothered, do we, as evangelicals today, by the sin of greed or covetousness. But it seems to be, with the eye, what we see, and the hand, what we put in our mouths. Jesus says, if they cause you to sin, hack them off. Cut it off. A radical response is required. True greatness amongst the disciples is seen in removing from your life whatever tempts you to sin. We are to oppose sin at all costs. It's clearly figurative because in a sense the hand, the foot and the eye aren't the problem. The, the problem is the heart. 
It's the heart that we need to take to Calvary. It's the heart that we need to take to the Saviour who's there hanging for us, bleeding for us, dying for us. And in the light of him hanging there on the cross looking at us in our lust or our covetousness or our greed, what have we got to say about our sin? Well, in the light of Calvary, we confess our sin. And we do everything to oppose sin in our lives. To put it to death. To strangle it before it's conceived. In Pete's words from this morning, to slaughter it. To cultivate within us, by God's grace, a love for him and a hatred to show contempt to him, which is what sin is. To so guard our hearts and to keep them sensitive that we hate to sin, which is to defy him, deny him, despise him. He's the lover of our souls. We're to do everything to oppose sin. And Jesus adds to that by illustration another warning. It strikes me that Jerusalem and Shepshed have at least one thing in common. They both have an incinerator. Jerusalem had an incinerator. It was the rubbish dump, Gehenna. And a bit like our incinerator, more so in Jerusalem, it was on fire the whole time. The, the smell, the offal, the rubbish, the fire was never quenched. And it came to be an illustration for hell, where the worm doesn't die and the fire's never quenched. And Jesus, in trying to encourage the disciples that he loves not to cause others to stumble and not to sin, reminds them it's better to go to heaven missing a hand, foot or eye than to retain them and go to hell. I think it's Don Carson who says how very out of touch Jesus must have been to warn disciples about hell. You certainly don't find that in the 21st century, do you? Jesus did it. A lack of desire to deal drastically with sin is no evidence of the fruit of true conversion. If in the light of this third point tonight there was one thing that you know you must now do, what would it be? What do you know without any doubt at all God is calling upon you to kill, slaughter, strangle, put to death tonight? Then for his glory do it. True greatness is seen in lowly service, in prizing grace in others and dealing ruthlessly with our own sin, which includes our propensity to cause others to stumble. Let's be keen for lowly service, keen to prize others and their grace, keen to deal ruthlessly with our own sin, particularly those, quote, respectable sins, which of course aren't respectable at all, but are malice and our bitterness and our envy and all those particularly hidden things that do more than lurk in the hearts of so many evangelicals. In summary and in conclusion, notice that in verses 49 and 50, mention of fire, the fire of hell, seems to lead to the thought that everyone will meet with fire. Everyone will be seasoned with fire, Jesus says, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. So from hell he goes to another fire, and from fire he goes to salt. What does he mean? I think here he's probably speaking of disciples, and particularly the trials that they're going to face in life, the trials of faith which are there to purify us. But more significant than that, he's saying every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Well, what's the background to that? Well, the background to that is Old Testament, Leviticus 2, verse 13, where salt had to be added to which offering? The burnt offering. The burnt offering had to be accompanied with salt. And I think what Jesus is saying here in conclusion is, true greatness, being a, a living disciple, you've got to be a living sacrifice. 
Because true discipleship lays claim to the whole of your life. Yes, Jesus is the ultimate burnt offering consumed for us, but we in response to that are to be wholly consumed for him. True discipleship lays claim to the whole of our lives. Trials will make you more distinctive. You'll become like salt, a preservative in a society that otherwise is going rotten. How much our society needs salt today. But do that, he says, and have peace. And that'll keep you from your disputes. And take heed, because once you've lost your saltiness, you can't re-salt yourself. So heed what I've said and put it into practice. True greatness is seen in lowly service, in prizing the grace in others, and dealing ruthlessly with sin. As we finish, why? Why is true discipleship and true greatness seen in those things? And the answer, as we know, in this section in Mark, which is dealing with the king's suffering as a pattern, it's because the nature of true discipleship follows the pattern of true messiahship. Where do we see perfect greatness? What does true greatness look like? Well, true greatness is seen in lowly service. That's Christ. He's the servant of all. He washes his disciples' feet. He queues up for undignified, demeaning service. And more than that, he goes to the cross and gives his life a ransom for many. Hanging there in humiliation, a demeaning and undignified death. He's made sin and a curse for us. His love of lowly service goes to him offering himself as a burnt offering, wholly consumed in our place. Secondly, true greatness is seen in prizing others and their grace. Well, he came and he died for others, didn't he? For the lowly, we sang about that in our last hymn. My soul to bless. O love of God, O wondrous grace, should pay my penalty and make me whole. Can this be so, all this for me, Lord? Oh, yes. True greatness is seen in prizing others. And the Lord Jesus Christ so prized his people that he came and died for them. And he now chooses to work through them And we're not many wise or mighty or noble, but we're not to despise one another. We're to honour him by prizing others in a way which will never match the way that he has prized us. And true greatness is seen in dealing ruthlessly with sin. Well, no man ever dealt as ruthlessly with sin as did the Lord Jesus Christ. He had no sin of his own. He committed none. But he died for it once and for all, ruthlessly dealing with it by being made sin and a curse for us. Enduring, we believe, for a while, the abandonment we heard of this morning and the hell where the fire is not. And that is true greatness. And Jesus Christ is true greatness personified. So let's worship him and trust him and love him and be keen to honour him and to serve him as disciples not in a way which is less than great but in lowly service in prizing the grace in others and in dealing ruthlessly with our own sin. Our closing hymn tonight is 73.
in word of life praise. We sing the first two verses, then we wait for the introduction to the third verse where there's a key change, and in that final third verse, we repeat the last four lines. Let's stand and sing. Thank you. 